Kingdom Come Deliverance has one of the most fascinating video game location choices in recent gaming history. Sure, there exist many game franchises that will take a historical setting and reimagine it in a unique way. The most obvious example being Assassin's Creed. Every new release usually takes a well-known city and historical era, and despite the horrific inaccuracies found in these games, the player can at least enjoy exploring a famous location from history. But that's not quite what Kingdom Come does. Whilst other games might rely on familiar locations to promote their games, Warhorse Studios took a seemingly random part of rural Bohemia, which, at least outside of Czechia, basically no one has ever heard of. And what's more, their portrayal of this little-known region is extraordinarily realistic. Every historical building in the area seems to have been rendered with excruciating detail. In-depth research has been done into medieval city planning and livelihoods of villages and townsfolk. You can even see a clear resemblance of the in-game map and satellite maps. Despite the river being slightly shorter in-game, it is completely recognisable. With the recent announcement of Kingdom Come Deliverance 2, we wanted to take a look at the original game's location and investigate the history behind it firsthand. Last May, we organised a road trip to visit all the historical locations portrayed in KCD1. We spent a night in the real-life Rattai. We visited Sasau or Sazava. Jesus Christ be praised. <laughs> And we interviewed a local expert on the history of the monastery. Yes, uh, historic in bits. Yeah. And we're pleased to tell you that we managed to get an exclusive interview with Tobias Stoltzwilling and Victor Herschel from Warhorse Studios, who gave us an insight into how a video game company researches and reimagines a world from the past for their game to exist in. So join us on our journey to modern day Bohemia as we explore the towns and villages across the banks of the Sazava River. We will retrace Henry of Scalitz's steps and shine a light on the rich history and culture of this part of the world. And stick around until the end, where we ask our friends at Warhorse Studios a couple of questions about the upcoming sequel and what we might expect from 15th century Gutenberg. As always, if you haven't already, don't forget to like and subscribe for more history in bits. Before we start our trip, let's clear something up. Why Bohemia? Or perhaps more specifically, why Ratai, Sasau, and Scalitz? The entire project is a very vision-driven thing by our creative director, Daniel Vabra, who was looking for a story that is small enough so that it can take place at one map or at one certain area, but also vague enough so that we can place our own Henry story kind of in this situation. In Czech Republic, the Hussite Wars and everything that follows after the stories of Henry, uh, that was a big thing that is still forming and shaped the way how Central Europe developed later then and how religion developed and so on. And there were big things going on, but we were looking for something smaller that is grabbable in a video game and in which you can have some form of impact. But perhaps the most important reason as to why it is set in Bohemia is the impact of the Hussite Wars on European history, of which Kingdom Come Deliverance acts as a prequel to these events. We arrived in Ratai in the evening around 9 o'clock. There were very few road signs on the way, and by the time we were about 10 minutes away, we didn't pass a single car. Ratai in Kingdom Come Deliverance is the largest and most important settlement in-game, with a bustling city centre of villagers and refugees from Scalitz. It is where Henry essentially comes of age, taking on his new duties in the service of Sir Radzik, as well as becoming squire to Sir Hans Capon. It is also where he comes to terms with his new life after the traumatic sacking of Scalitz. From a gameplay perspective, Ratai teaches the player the bread and butter of KCD mechanics, the economy in the various merchants and how trading and haggling works, the discovery of taverns as locations to drink, gamble and provide safe saving locations, and also the basics of the fiendishly complex combat system through the tuition from Captain Bernard, and of course, from the less legit means to earn in Grushin, such as pickpocketing and lockpicking. Gee, my god, what are you doing? Stop that, you magpie! Ultimately, Ratai is one of the most vibrant, busy, and important cities that Henry experiences in this story.
real life ratai in the 21st century is, well, not exactly these things. With a population of about 600, it really is tiny in comparison to the other settlements nearby. The road from the south of the town was quiet and narrow, and whilst we had arrived fairly late, there was hardly any sign of life along the old cobbled streets. All except for the only pub in town. Perhaps this is where we could find that feeling of energy and vibrancy seen in KCD's ratai. The bartender seemed uneasy at our presence, and signalled to us that we could have just one drink before leaving immediately. But this sense of caution and uneasiness shared by the locals and bartender alike seemed to dissipate quickly as it became clear we weren't looking for any trouble. In the end, he let us stay for three more drinks and showed us a few pictures of the town of Ratai from the olden days. We left with the impression that the people were perhaps uneasy with unfamiliar faces, but actually well-meaning and friendly. Nevertheless, this was far from the Ratai we were expecting. After visiting the tavern, we headed to our accommodation. Amazingly, it was exactly in the main square of Ratai that we recognised from KCD, and virtually in the same location of the house of the wealthy merchant Wolfram Pruder. After a long day of travelling, and drinking, we thought it best to explore more in the morning, and got some well-needed rest. The next day, we got up early, and after a quick wash, thankfully not from an outside bucket like poor Henry, we set out to see the sights of Ratai. In daylight, the square was uncannily familiar to the square found in Kingdom Come's Ratai. The centre of the square, where you can find a set of stocks in-game, there is now a tranquil garden, with a modest crucifix as its centrepiece. There was no hustle and bustle of a marketplace, but all was quiet, apart from the odd car driving past. The first building we investigated was where the Rat House used to be. Today it serves as an administrative building, as well as an elementary school. Whilst looking very different to what it looks like in-game, it was in the precise location of the KCD Town Hall, and with the town and duchy shields clearly on display, it gave a similar aura of grandeur. Next door, once again exactly the same as in-game, was the Church of St Matthew. Once again, this building is far newer than the one depicted in KCD, however the style and layout of the building still looks uncanny today. The church currently standing there dates back only to the late 17th century, but was inspired by an older building built in the 1360s, which the game seems to accurately depict. Unfortunately, the church and its cemetery were closed, but we managed to take some shots from afar. As we approached the lower castle, known as Berg Perkstein, we could still see the original tower still intact. We could see the recognisable landscape of the nearby forestry of the Ratai Woods, and we could even see the old city gate still standing. In game, this is where Saradzig and his company take refuge after the sacking of Scalots, and it is also where Henry can move into as he climbs the social ladder. It felt pretty surreal to walk here in real life. Perkstein Castle was mentioned for the first time in 1346, a good half a century before the start of the story of KCD, but it is alleged to have been built slightly earlier than that, at the start of the 14th century by the Lippe family an ancient bohemian noble family. According to the in-game codex, it was damaged twice, once by a fire in 1446, and again 100 years later during a peasant's revolt. It was rebuilt into a presbytery and bell tower in 1724. Unfortunately, the tower was all we could see. Bizarrely, it appears that the courtyard and the rest of the building was actually someone's private property. We politely asked the guy at his door, if we could film for this documentary. He promptly refused and tied this string across his door to encourage us to leave. It felt pretty awkward. We asked Tobias and Victor if they ever had any difficulty with researching some private locations like this, but for them it was quite the opposite. Victor, who recently was working on mapping out townhouses in Kutenberg for KCD2, told us about the experience. Usually if it was private property, People were really excited about to showing someone that they finally found someone who actually cared about them having this uh, medieval building. 
we uh, met even the families who really took care of it. They were proud of the way how they are reconstructing the stuff in the historical way and really trying to respect uh, the house as it is. But can you imagine the funny situation? Most of the big buildings are public, like, I don't know, the, the castles or whatever, or churches and so on. But then you, you see some blokes knocking on your door saying, hey, uh, we are doing this game we can't tell you about. Can we see your cellar, please? There were, there were many funny situations coming up like that. But most of them were super eager to help us, of course, exactly as... as uh, but yeah, so sometimes it took a few awkward minutes to explain <laughs> exactly what, what is going on, that we are not trying to find what nice historical stuff they have in their homes. <laughs> uh, but yeah. We're not going to rob you. We just want to make pictures of everything. Not suspicious at all. As we walked up the main road of Ratai, we started to see more signs of life. The bar itself is where one of the in-game taverns sits. We don't know whether or not this was intentional by the game devs, but it is certainly a nice touch. It is opposite a junction that leads us up towards our final Ratai KCD landmark, the Upper Castle. This is where Hanush of Lepa resides, and is the main seat of power for the town of Ratai. It is also where the tourney happens, and is perhaps the most impressive building in the town. Before we investigated further, I noticed this square outline of bricks to the side of the castle. But there was no real way of discerning what that was. But during our interview, Tobias told us this. When you're at the upper castle of Rata and you look down the city, first of all, I, I strongly believe that you immediately recognize KCD2 when you stand there and look down. But when you go out of the castle on the left side, there's actually a staircase or something and some, some trees or something, but there's still the basement of a church, some walls of a church, outline of a church that's still standing there. And in KCD, we rebuilt the church there. War Studios were able to gather a lot of info from foundations like these as well as the basements of buildings still standing, which helped them rebuild places like medieval Ratai. Going back to the upper castle, of course, this exterior looks much different to what it used to be. This is because while its original building date was probably close to the one of Perkstein Castle down the street, this upper one was rebuilt into a Renaissance castle in the 17th century, roughly giving its current form. Today, it serves as the town hall, as well as housing a museum, which, again, unfortunately was closed during our visit. But here we saw our first Kingdom Come references, which could be seen on various posters and on the bulletin board. We were really sad to miss out on this event. As we just mentioned, the current building is far more recent than the medieval castle that we see in KCD. But in actual fact, it truly is amazing how true to this building the game developers were in terms of detail. In real life, evidence of that castle can still be seen here, through the old walls upon which the building stands. This long patch of grass by the city entrance is where the archery range can be found in-game. Walking around the courtyard, where you find the stables and the tawny area in KCD, it felt remarkably similar to real life, and modelled precisely to scale. But my favourite detail is this part of the wall by the outer gate. It's virtually identical. As we walked the streets of Ratai, we did not get the same impression of a bustling market town that one might feel playing Kingdom Come. In fact, it was quite the opposite. There was a sense that this village was from a bygone era, and perhaps was not as prosperous as it used to be. There were old derelict shops and an abandoned hotel, and despite it being a long holiday weekend while we visited, we were literally the only visitors and tourist attractions were closed, not open. But Victor told us that Kingdom Come had sparked a renewed interest in the town's history. Ratai, for instance, today, we like Ratai, but to be honest, it's a dead end, kinda, and today <laughs> it's past its former glory. So when we came there, there wasn't even a pub in town. I'm not saying that we made a game, now they have a pub, but I'm saying that the, the research we started to kick in actually motivated someone else to join us as well. So we were trying to figure out where the city walls of Ratai were, and someone told us there were no walls, and at the end of the day they found the walls. I remember visiting, we found it odd that there was a lack of city walls that makes KCD's Ratai proudly stand out across the landscape. 
Furthermore, the main road of the village snaked around the church, which differs from KCD's map. On closer inspection, it appeared that there was some very old brick beneath the road, as you can see here. We wondered whether this could be part of the walls that Warhorse Studios helped rediscover. So perhaps Ratai is long past its glory days as a local seat of power during the 15th century. But despite this, Ratai still maintains a great deal of charm and beauty that perhaps stems from having remained untouched by the overly commercial world of tourism. After this trip with the History and Bits team, I visited Prague for a few days on holiday with my partner. Whilst it's a very beautiful city, with jaw-dropping architecture and attractions, I was overwhelmed by the sheer size of the crowds and the amount of tacky souvenir shops and tourist traps. Instead, I found myself longing to return to a more peaceful and genuine Ratai for a few more nights. After a morning walking and exploring Ratai, we set off to visit what is today the largest settlement in the region of Kingdom Come, Sasau or Sazava as it is properly called in Czech. We began as Henry would, by riding through the real-life village of Ledechko. Of course, there is not anything man-made in this small village that has survived since the 15th century that is depicted in KCD worth comparing to in real life, and we were pleased to say that they finally built a bridge that we could pass over, rather than wading through the river. But this river, the Sazava River, has been effectively depicted in-game to match the real-life equivalent. You can even see the rapids here, which match the rapids depicted in-game. Here, you can see that where the IRL rapids are, the villagers have built a simple dam. The Sazava River, among other important rivers in the region, like the Vltava, was vital in shaping the history and culture of the region. And according to the medievalist Lisa Wolverton, the Lower Elbe River system, which the Sazava is an important part of, was crucial in establishing Bohemia as a distinct historical region in the Middle Ages. In her book Hastening Toward Prague, she writes of Moravia and Bohemia, the two historical regions making up today's Czechia, that the two regions are geographically distinct, separated not only by forest, but oriented on different river systems. Bohemia comprises the watershed for the Elbe flowing north. The Ogra and the Vlitova flow into the Elbe, the Borunka and Sazava into the Vltava. In Moravia, however, the three main rivers, Morava, Svratka, and Duya, flow south, eventually joining the Danube. River traffic thus leads out in opposite directions rather than connecting Bohemia and Moravia to one another. So the Sazava not only shaped its immediate surroundings by connecting the different towns we can see in the KCD universe, but among other rivers, always ensured the region's connectivity to northwestern Europe, separating its Bohemian character from the more eastern-oriented Moravia. As mentioned in the introduction, the game devs did have to change the map somewhat, and you can see in this comparison of maps that the Sazava River has been shortened and has far less bends than in real life. But this is a perfectly understandable change to make, in order to prioritize gameplay over unnecessarily big maps. Not naming any names, but it would be a far cry to expect players to traverse stupidly big maps to give the illusion of endless content. That being said, as we travelled from Ledechko, it became clear that we couldn't simply drive in the general direction to Zazava like Henry might on horseback, because the roads were so rural and narrow, not designed for our Toyota. Instead, by modern roads it made more sense for us to travel via Townberg, or Townbeck, in real life. As well as Ledechko, we also passed nearby Meriohead and Samopesh. To our surprise, when initially planning our journey, we found that every single named village in KCD corresponds to a real-world location that can literally be found on Google Maps. The same can be said of even the layout of the roads on the KCD map and on the modern map IRL. Victor told us about their process of mapping the world, and how by using modern geomapping technology, the towns end up being as accurate as possible to how this part of Bohemia would look like in the 15th century. We are getting uh, geo data, geo scans for creating the rough terrain map. So we get all the heights and valleys and rivers and 
roads and such things in which we can get from those data. Interestingly though, in those data you can usually see even some older uh, reminiscence of older buildings which are uh, in the terrain map you can usually see where the walls were uh, for, for the castles or some uh, ditches and things like that which is pretty cool. Then we scout the location, uh, how it looks these days. Basically go, go there, take the photos, uh, additional scans using drones and things like that. Then we compared all these data with the research we do in the libraries, in the going through the books, to the historical publications. And we compared these things together and then we are trying to recreate this vision, uh, that idea into the 3D space. In game, Talmberg is Henry's first place of refuge after the sacking of Scalads, and it is the seat of power for Sir Divish and Lady Stephanie. Today, all that is left of Sir Divish's original keep is this solitary tower and a few crumbling old walls. These ruins are specifically the largest tower of Talmberg keep you can see in game. What is interesting is that when comparing KCD's keep to real life, you can still see this gate next to the tower and the walls are accurate to the crumbling walls that you can see in real life. I only noticed this whilst editing, but look closely at the Arch of the Ruins and the Arch in Kingdom Come. What incredible attention to detail. According to online sources, the castle was already deserted in the 16th century, and then in the 18th and 19th century, people from the village just started building on the old grounds. In 1933, after part of the tower collapsed, it was decided to adjust the tower and make it lower for safety reasons. It was a little sad to see the castle ruins in such disrepair. It appeared that it was not officially looked after at all. In fact, next to the ruins of the wall were various private houses and a fenced off area containing private garden allotments. It reminded us of Berg Perkstein in Ratai, how it was not open to the public standing only to remind onlookers of a time long ago. I wonder what Sir Divish would think seeing his keep reduced to this. Other than these ruins, nothing else remains of the keep, and where the city walls would be there is nothing to see but woodland. This poorly looked after monument to a bygone era did not detract from the natural beauty surrounding Talmberg, and there was still a proud history to be seen. The Tamburk Castle ruins can be seen in this old photograph on display here at the local bus stop. We continued along the road for a brief visit to Uzich, a drive that in real life only took about three minutes. There was only one thing for us to see here, and that was the church. That in-game was the place that Henry gives a sermon for the benefit of the morally hypocritical, but otherwise massive lad, Father Godwin. The church in the centre is once again the precise location that it has shown in Kingdom Come Deliverance. The modern church is called Costel Pani Maria, which translates to Mary Mother of Jesus. Of course, it is much different to the church depicted in game. It is more ornate, with an orthodox style spire, but it retains the octagonal apse, where the altar stands, which existed from KCD's era. According to Czech art historian Anezka Merhaltova, the old church there, which is shown in KCD, was built in the early 13th century in Romanesque style. Only small parts of the wall still go back to this original structure, and most of the church was rebuilt or added in the 15th century and the 17th century. After the church, we had a quick drive through the village, over the small river to the other side. We followed the exact same path that you can take in Kingdom Come. In game, the village is depicted in a sort of valley, with the river at the bottom. On the other side, in game, you can get a beautiful view of the village in this wide open space. And while there was evidence of this valley, we were unable to get such a good view because of the much heavier forestation in real life. This was a running theme throughout our journey. We noticed that while there are some beautiful wide open spaces over fields that lend itself to picturesque views of the countryside, we encountered far more woodland 
than Henry did in the 15th century. We thought that perhaps food production played a role in this. In the modern day, food is so globalised, there is no need for so much local food production, and much of the medieval farmland that would have dominated the landscape has ceased to exist. In our interview, Victor confirmed this, and gave an interesting example that proves that there was less woodland in the 15th century. Around the Gutenberg city, where there was this huge industrial activity, there is even some mentions in, in the books that uh, they needed to bring the wood even hundreds of kilometers from the northern parts of the uh, of the Bohemia to the city to use in the in the mines and for all those small trees and stuff. But fascinatingly, we actually had it the other way around. According to Warhorse Studios, KCD actually has more woodland than what they believed 15th century Bohemia had. And the reason for this is for gameplay performance. We believe there was even in some areas less woods than we have in the game. So from what we have now, today's definitely less than today, but even probably less than in the game. But it would be really uncomfortable for us to work for the gameplay and then all the technical issues like the loading uh, distances and stuff. So we needed these visual barriers there and there. This is the compromise of these uh, informations and ne different needs. And, and as I said, those compromises are almost always due to technical reasons. So more trees or more forests means that the Exactly as Victor said, the draw distances don't have to be so long. We can work around that and so on. So, And last, of course, it also looks nice. It's true. The combo of wide open fields bordered by woodlands really does look nice. One other detail that we noticed on our travels was the absence of shrines across the landscape. In KCD, you can't go far without bumping into one of these crosses on the sides of the road. And whilst we saw a few in the villages that we visited, we actually encountered far more crosses on our drive from Vienna in northern Austria. After we crossed the border to Czechia, we saw far fewer. One explanation could be because of the Hussite Wars, which was a clash between the Protestants and the Catholics, and Protestantism famously had a problem with the idolatry that Catholicism practices. But it also can be explained by the communist era in the 20th century, which heavily suppressed religion. We asked Warhorse about this, and whilst Victor pointed out that you can still find many shrines if you know where to look, both Tobias and Victor agreed that communism did the most damage in this case. More they could get rid of it, the better, but also, as Victor said, the villages and the countryside still have them. It's definitely way less than it where it was in, in, in pre-communist and, and pre-Protestant times. So far, all of the places we had visited were small, peaceful, and generally had no visitors or little tourism industry to speak of. But then, we arrived at Sasau, or Suzava, which in modern day is the largest settlement in the area. We could immediately tell that the town had a different vibe altogether. Sasava is a town of about 3,800 inhabitants, and was founded around Suzava Monastery in the 11th century which is still the town's most famous landmark. It is clearly a much bigger place today, relatively speaking, than Sasal in KCD. We began our visit at Herbitov Church, which felt uncannily familiar to St. Martin's Church in KCD. You can see that both churches have the exact same layout. In Kingdom Come, the wall is higher and the church is atop a taller hill. We think this is probably because, over time, as roads get built upon again and again, the ground will raise little by little. The church, on the other hand, has not been built upon, so retains the same height. On the other side, you can see the tower has been extended slightly, and the body of the church is longer. The game devs once again show an amazing attention to detail in the layout of the brick. The main square in-game now functions as a little parkway, but the way the road splits in two around it was very familiar to how it felt in-game. This seemed to be where the main shops were, although, as it was a public holiday, it was pretty quiet. There was even a pub called Bar Scorpion in the precise location of this tavern, although the locals here in real life did not seem as keen to stop for a chat as they do with Henry. 
And that was not the only familiar feeling. We continue to walk on foot over the main bridge that looks over the river Sazava. There, in the distance to the right, you could see the monastery towering over the landscape. And, perhaps more exciting considering we hadn't yet had lunch, there, on the left, was a pub. This was now the third time that we found a real-life tavern in the same location as an in-game tavern. It now felt less like a coincidence and more like an intentional easter egg that the game devs have included. This is also probably my favourite tavern in Kingdom Come. It's the one where you meet your old friends from Scalots. Hey, how'd you get so f***ed up? Where you rendezvous with the German knight Ulrich, and where you find a way, through legit or sneaky means, to get the right documents you need to disguise yourself as a trainee monk to infiltrate the monastery. We did none of those things. But we did enjoy a hefty lunch of traditional bohemian food and something to wash it down with. If you are ever in Sazava, be sure to check out Hostinec Zavodl for some good Czech food. After lunch, we headed straight to the monastery. And wow, as we approached the gate, it was incredible to be greeted by that tower. Never has a place I have never visited felt so familiar. The tower in real life is the spitting image of the tower you can find in Kingdom Come, down to the exact brick, and that's hardly an exaggeration. Compare these two stills of the tower, and how closely the architecture lines up. The only difference being the additional layer at the top with the clock. We needed a moment to soak it all in. And unlike the previous monuments we visited, this was actually a popular tourist destination, as you can see from the crowds. The monastery itself is dedicated to Saint Procopius. He lived in the first half of the 11th century, was founder and the first abbot of the monastery, and was canonised in 1204. As with many saints of the time, it is unclear why exactly he was canonised, as historians today have not been able to dig up more about him than his occupation and year of death. But he was very important for the iconography of Catholic Bohemia, and to this day, is the patron saint of the city of Suzaba. The first stone building was of Romanesque style in the 12th century, and Gothic buildings were added in the 13th and 14th century, which is close to the building we can see in the KCD version. The Hussite Wars of the 15th century brought an end to the building activities, and the monastery survived in critical condition for two centuries, without the tower ever being finished. Perhaps the Devil Skull did curse its construction after all. Finally, from the 17th century, the Austrians started rebuilding and adding to the venerable monastery. Today, it is a museum, including regular tours and a gift shop that actually sells KCD memorabilia. We signed up for a tour and first explored the monastery gardens. In game, there is a little chapel here, which now only the base of the church remains. There is a model of what the Holy Cross Church would have looked like inside the monastery, and it is clear that the game devs took note. Anyone who bothered to do that tedious quest where you had to do some weeding in the herb garden, you'll be pleased to know that that patch of ground is now completely overgrown. Sorry, Brother Nicomedus. After that, we got to enter the monastery itself. Thankfully, we didn't have to pretend to be monks and bluff our way through mass to be let in. But, needless to say, Warhorse Studios really outdid themselves with how they rendered the monastery. Here is the courtyard in the centre of the monastery, for example. And here are the cloisters you walk through. You can see that the ceiling here is ornately decorated with frescoes from hundreds of years ago, which is accurately depicted in-game. But. Not all the ceilings in the monastery are like this. When talking to Tobias and Victor, they told us that the entire ceilings used to be covered in these frescoes like you find in Kingdom Come. But tragically, a lot of the historical art and monuments across the country was destroyed during the communist era, in a similar way to the shrines discussed earlier. Not only did they ha hate religion generally, but also the system of aristocracy and nobles and so on. So they took 
uh, really beautiful um, castles and, and, and chateaus and these kind of wonderful buildings and overpainted all the paintings that were inside to make a, I don't know what, a, a arsenal for weapons or soldiers or uh, I don't know, so, something in there and uh, and they destroyed a lot of history. A side note here. If anyone visits Prague and wants to learn more about the communist era in Czechoslovakia, take a couple of hours to visit the Communism Museum. It gives an interesting and very moving account on the Soviet oppression of this country. The tour of the monastery took us through the side rooms which follow a layout I recognise from in-game, but of course looked much different today. Part of it had been renovated into a museum, and there was also this impressively ornate hall with a Baroque-style fresco on the ceiling. There was even a part of the tour dedicated to the depiction of the monastery in Kingdom Come Deliverance, but, alas, the tour itself was all in Czech. But we were lucky enough to get a quick interview with the tour guide, Slavka, in which we asked her what she thought of how accurately Warhorse Studios depicted the monastery. Podoba sázovského kláštera z české videohry Kingdom Come Deliverance je v některých částech velmi přesná. Stavba kostela, zahrada se základy kostela svatého kříže, tetrakoncha. Některé prostory v interiérech ovšem tvůrci nemohli vědět, že jsou gotické že byly a jak vypadaly gotické prostory, protože je převrstvilo baroko. A tam si už museli tak trošku vymýšlet. Ale to i v těchto prostorách, co bylo vymýšleno, je, není jenom jakýsi výmysl, ale pracovali podle ideálních středověkých dispozic a výzdoby Slavka also showed us some exclusive areas not initially depicted on her tour, including the chapter hall, which part of it has survived since the 14th century. And she even showed us underneath the floors, where you can see the original stone layout of the monastery from over 600 years ago. Um, you can, uh, you can... Oh. Oh, this wow. is, for example, um, the part of this room. Yes. Uh, if I shine a yeah. light, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Thank you, Slavka, for all your help. Sazava Monastery stood in stark contrast to some of the other monuments we had visited on our journey. Unfortunately, because of the times of communism, many of the historical landmarks were not looked after and fell into obscurity or actively suppressed, particularly those that may have had a connection to Christianity. But it was thanks to an individual parish pastor known as Pater Clement, who managed to sustain the spiritual life here throughout both Nazi occupation and Soviet oppression. Slavka was very proud to tell us about the monastery's rejuvenation. Po druhé světové válce byl farářem kostela v arálu bývalého kláštera benediktínský mnich jménem Pater Clement, velká osobnost. On objevil jeskyni svatého Prokopa, přitahl zájem archeologů, historiků umění a proto bylo možné i začátkem komunismu dále zkoumat klášter archeologicky, kunzhistoricky. Ano, neprobíhaly žále velké obnovy, ale přišlo se na dalších mnoho poznatků, které budeme v dnešní a budoucí době zhodnocovat. Připravujeme se na obnovu z přístupnění svatoprokopské jeskyně. Thanks to our Discord member Dine for helping us with the Czech translations. Before we left Bohemia, there was one final location to visit, Skalitz. This is of course Henry's birthplace and home, before it is sacked by Sigismund and his Cuman forces. This is historically accurate, as after King Wenceslas IV made Radzig Kobola the town's burgrave, just like in game as well, 
It was, in the same year, besieged, conquered, and burned by the army of Sigismund when he attacked Bohemia before becoming Holy Roman Emperor. The prosperous town, its prosperity coming from the silver mines the town is named after, fortunately recovered soon. In 1413 to 1415, it was rebuilt, and was ruled by a Coleman Krikofi, before finally being transferred to the property of Sazava Monastery. Just 14 years after the destruction depicted in-game, Scarlet's got the prestigious title of Market Town for the first time. We intended to stop at what is known in-game as Rovna, but today, this is a part of the town of Scarlet's. When Henry returns here for the first time after the attack, you see this disturbing cutscene of piles of bodies in the rain, causing Henry to throw up. In reality, our visit was a bit different. It was in a quiet and secluded location, next to a meadow which you could see the centre of Scalas from. It was probably one of the most beautiful and peaceful visits of our entire journey, and stood in stark contrast to the remnants of a massacre you discover in-game. Afterwards, we continued on to the centre of Scalas. As you can probably guess, there was basically no evidence of the medieval village or castle that used to be here. Instead, we just found a small, picturesque town. We walked up the hill towards where the keep used to be, and we were greeted by our final closed church of the journey. It was a sweet little building, but a shame we could not see any hard evidence of ruins of keep. It made us wonder, how did Warhorse Studios go about replicating a village that no longer exists? Well, we asked them, and interestingly, it really isn't much different from how they replicate still existing settlements. They can use the same geomapping data as they do with existing towns. They thoroughly investigate archaeological research, and then they use examples of the standard layouts of contemporary villages. From that, they can rationally fill in the blanks of what is left. Tobias also pointed out this. Especially in those times when you were rebuilding stuff, you were either using existing layouts, take today's roads and highways and everything, they're very often based on Roman roads and so on, and so there's usually, it's based on something, you take the knowledge of the people from before, and I believe that Silver Skullets had the same situation, that they kind of knew what to build where, but by that time, castles were not that important anymore, like they were before maybe, so then why rebuild that ginormous, extremely expensive uh, war fortification, let's just praise Jesus or whatever and put a church in there. Whilst the story of Henry is fiction, it is undeniable that the world of Kingdom Come is as faithful to history as can be. The careful and passionate research Warhorse Studios has done really shines in their finished product, and I can only expect the upcoming sequel to be of the same calibre. As we stood there in modern day Scalas, even if our beloved Henry never existed, it was a somber thought to know that once, this place was brutally burnt to the ground, killing many innocent people. Over the course of human history, many instances of violence and brutality have happened in the very places we still live in today. During this trip, I was particularly moved by the accounts I learned of the senseless oppression of the USSR. This can only serve as a reminder to us of how lucky we are to be alive today. This appreciation for our surroundings can be deepened when we understand our history, and understand how far we've come. Warhorse Studios have greatly contributed to this by bringing the world of 15th century Bohemia to a much wider audience than before, and this has not only rekindled an interest in Czech culture and history from local Czech people, but introduced this rich and fascinating history to people from all over the world. Yes, we are doing a video game, but still we are excited when we are breaching the video game sphere and go into history, culture, art and so music for us it's 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 huge that uh that we are breaching those walls and that uh that kcd becomes more than just a game but becomes something of a cultural thing eventually right thanks for sticking with us for so long as promised in the intro here's what our friends at warhorse studios have to say 
about the historical locations we'll be visiting in Kingdom Come Deliverance 2. That, that is very interesting. Uh, uh, so it's, it actually ties to the question you had in the beginning, why Ratai and Sazava, why Bohemia? Well, the type of story we were explaining in KCD1 took place in Ratai and the surrounding, and we needed to find something that uh, s small enough, big enough, and so on, that we can cover it in a game. And the story that we are telling did not finish in KCD1. It actually continues, but... Uh, Kuttenberg is where uh, things go south, kinda, in that area. And by that time, in 1403, Kuttenberg city was culturally, uh, economically, at least equal to Prague. Maybe even more important, if you consider that these, A, it was full of silver mines, of course, cash. Everyone needs cash to finance wars and clothes and royal court but also the um, bohemian silver was mint there for the entire kingdom so owning that be th that is a that is a, a huge strategical point in warfare there uh, and historically king sigismund who invaded who invaded bohemia of course went after that silver especially because he again wanted to finance life and wars against the ottomans and so on and so on and so on so uh, it just makes for the story and for the thing we are want to explain and show so much sense to go to Kuttenberg. Plus, of course, it's still existing today. It's a um, UNESCO World Heritage Site and so on. But we also could have said, let's go to Prague because Prague is probably the, the thing that would sell better because everyone kind of knows Prague for the bridges and beer and I don't know what. But we said this doesn't make sense for the story we are telling. So we are not going for the flashy thing, but for the... Uh, but, but still, Kuttenberg is flashy, don't understand me wrong. But we just took the one that is so much more important for the story we are telling. And again, offers, offers us enough space to come up with our own fictional story about Henry and so on that has interesting gameplay. It's silver mining, all the caves and mines below it, probably thieves or something running around and so on. So uh, it, it just it just ticked all the boxes for us. And uh, we said Kuttenberg is the way to go. But the game does not start in Kuttenberg. It, uh, you get there naturally. But KCD1 ends with a task that you have to deliver a letter to Otto von Berghof in Trotsky Castle, and Trotsky Castle is what, around about 110, 120 or so kilometers north of Gutenberg, so a different place actually. Um, so um, we had that part, Henry and his uh, entourage goes to, uh, to Trotsky and things go south, but Gutenberg is where King Sigismund was hanging around, and with King Sigismund is Marquardt von Aulitz, the antagonist of KCD1, and uh, Henry still has open um, discussions with him about what happened in the first place, uh, in the first case, uh, I mean. So it, it just made so much, so much sense for us. It's also amazing how our friends already after those two trailers uh, found so many clues uh, regarding the characters and locations and how they, which part of the history they played. So, uh, yeah, I, I think People are already getting uh, why we uh, choose this location and they will actually understand it much more when, when playing and finishing the game. I think it will kind of reveal why we, we choose this uh, location or the designers done choose the design on this location. We hoped you enjoyed joining us on our journey to the lands of Henry of Scalas. It was truly a joy to visit these places in real life and learn about these historical landmarks. This is not the sort of trip or video we could make regularly because of time and money, <laughs> but with your support on Patreon, we might be able to plan another trip like this in the future. So please consider joining our Patreon to help us out. Of course, your like and subscribe also helps us out immensely, so please do if you want to see more of our content. We're planning on doing some more videos on Kingdom Come in the future, bit of Crusader Kings as usual, 
as well as some other non-video game history related things. So see you next time for more history in bits.